We call the Tuesday, June 25th, 2019, work session meeting of the Portsmouth City Council to order. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Battle. Here. Mr. Clark. Here. Mr. Glover. Here. Vice Mayor Lucasburg. Here. Mr. Moody. Here. Ms. Simmons. Here. Mayor Rowe. Here. Uh, Dr. Pat. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council. The first presentation is the Norfolk Harbor Deepening Project. The Army Corps of Engineers, in cooperation with the Virginia Port Authority, is engaged in a project to widen and deepen the Norfolk Harbor navigation channels to accommodate larger ships making port calls in Hampton Roads. Tonight, Mr. Richard Klein, Chief of the Civil Programs Branch with the Norfolk District of the Army Corps of Engineers, will provide a briefing on this important project. The second presentation this evening is a joint briefing by the Army Corps of Engineers and the city's Public Works Mosquito Control Division on the issue of mosquito control. Mr. Keith Lockwood, Chief Operations Branch for the Norfolk District of the Army Corps of Engineers will provide a briefing on the mosquito control program at Craney Island followed by Mr. Tim Du Bois, the city's manager of mosquito control, to provide a briefing on the city's overall mosquito control program. The third and final presentation for this evening is a public safety update by Chief Angela Green. The department's quality of life enhancement initiative is ongoing and continues with the goal to reduce, suppress, disrupt, and eliminate incidents against individuals through intelligence-based resource allocation and various strategies. The police department recognizes the need for partnerships and collaboration with outside agencies, as well as the community we serve to reduce incidents within our communities. Mr. Klein. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor. City Council members, Dr. Patton and city staff. As Dr. Patton said, I'm Richard Klein with the Army Corps of Engineers and I'm here on behalf of the um, Norfolk District to provide you an update on the Norfolk Harbor Deepening Project. Uh, do, do I advance these, ma'am? There are two main elements of the project. The portion shown in blue is the Norfolk Harbor and Channel's outer portion and the portion shown in green is the Elizabeth River and Southern Branch. And on this chart, you can see the, um, some of the terminals that will be the primary beneficiaries of the project. Uh, they're abbreviated, you have the Portsmouth Marine Terminal, the Virginia International Gateway, the um, Norfolk International Terminal, the Newport News Marine Terminal. You also have the coal piers that will benefit, and then you have a number of different terminals in um, the cities of Norfolk, Chesapeake, and Portsmouth on the Elizabeth River and Southern Branch. The, um, the Norfolk Harbor and Channels portion is currently 50 feet, and the Elizabeth River and Southern Branch is, um, is a depth of 40 feet and then reducing to 35 feet in the uppermost portion within the city of Chesapeake. Just to provide you a little bit of background, we currently um, have a design agreement with the Virginia Port Authority for designing the, the Norfolk Harbor deepening portion. And I, and I understand you had a presentation from the Virginia Port Authority very recently. Uh, we're partnering with them on a 50-50 cost share basis to construct the project, but they're, they probably told you they're a bit ahead of us because they've already received their appropriations from the General Assembly and we're still working to get our construction appropriations lined up, but we do have funding and authority to start designing the project. The, um, on both cases, the Southern Branch and the Norfolk Harbor, we did three-year feasibility level studies to result in recommendations, and the, the, um, the Norfolk Harbor resulted in what's called a chief's report, which eventually uh, was, became authorized by the most recent Water Resources Act, uh, I think it was called Water Infrastructure for America Act of 20, 2018. For the Southern Branch in Elizabeth River, we did not recommend dimensions 
deeper than what was recommended in the 1986 Water Resources Act. So that was a validation report and doesn't require any additional authorization from Congress. And these are the project dimensions. Um, for the Norfolk Harbor, uh, the Atlantic Ocean Channel, which is currently 52 feet, would be deepened to 59 feet. And that's somewhat deeper because the large ships need additional underkeel clearance for safety out in the ocean channel. And coming into the Chesapeake Bay, the Thimble Shoal Channel would be 56 feet. And by the way, that's the maximum we can go with the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel in, in its place where it is. And there will be some widening for portions of that channel to allow for uh, the bigger ships to meet and pass. Then inside the Hampton Roads, the Norfolk Harbor Channel would be deepened from 50 feet to 55 feet as far upstream as Lambert's Point, which is um, where the coal piers are. And the Channel to Newport News would also be deepened to 55 feet. And these channels would also benefit the Virginia International Gateway, which connects to the channel opposite the Norfolk International Terminal. So the largest container ships that call on the um, East Coast would be able to use uh, these channels and, and the state terminals for, for container traffic. In the southern branch, the channel will be deepened from 40 feet to 45 feet as far upstream as the Purdue Grain Terminal, and then uh, from 40 feet to 42 feet as far upstream as, as Paradise Creek. And then from there, would be deepened from existing 35 feet depth to 39 feet as far upstream as the Gilmerton Bridge. And these are the uh, areas that would be used for the placement of the dredge material. There um, would be a total of between 25 and 30 million cubic yards of dredging for the, for the channels in blue, the outer channels, and a total of between 1.5 to 2 million cubic yards for deepening the Elizabeth River and Southern Branch. And of those amounts, about 9 to 10 million cubic yards uh, from the outer channels would go into the Craney Island uh, facility and about, um, from the southern branch, about one to two million. Most of that would go to Craney Island. Some of that is, doesn't meet our standards at Craney Island and would have to go to a, um, a landfill facility. We, we've been looking at one upstream on the James River called Port Tobacco. failed to mention that the, um, the port is working towards a construction start in January of 2020. So they're pretty far along on their plans and we're supporting them. So the, the outer channels should start under construction in January 2020 at Thimble Shoal Channel in the Chesapeake Bay. And from there we'll sequence the rest of it. Um, it'll take about three years in all and then um, the next, the next phase after that would be the Elizabeth River and Southern Branch. At this point, is that's the end of my presentation. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions? Yes. What's the total project cost? Yes. That's my question. The, the total project cost is about $270 million for the Norfolk Harbor Channel and about $130 million for the Elizabeth River Channel. 270 and 130? Yes, roughly, sir. Other questions? Right. Thank you very much. Do you anticipate any um, problems? We uh, don't anticipate any major problems. This is one of the um, nationwide, this is one of the projects that has the least issues in terms of environmental issues we, we you know we don't not without issues we have endangered sea turtles and other factors we have to take care of but generally there there are no real issues except not having the money to for the on the army army corps of engineers side to get started the port has their money we don't have our money yet we're, so we're working to get appropriations from congress that's really the biggest hurdle we have right now last week there was a dredge uh, coming up the river off of hospital point. Was that part of what uh, your maintenance for? Um, not sure which dredge that was, but there are a number of dredging projects underway in this area, and a couple of them are at Virginia Beach. There's also one in Thimble Shoal Channel, which is maintenance. 
So it could have been for any one of those projects. It probably wasn't for, I don't think we're doing any channel dredging right now, are we, Keith? No, just double shell like that. Yeah. And, and several dredge companies bring their dredges in this area for uh, repairs in the shipyard. Yes. And one other question. I guess when, when all of the monies are in place and the project begins, what's the time span? When can we expect our ships to be able to use the, I mean, they're using them now, but when would it be the finishing time? Roughly right? three years from the start. Yes. All right. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Keith Locke will, will begin our mosquito control. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor, uh, members of council, Dr. Patton, city staff. Uh, thanks for having me this evening. Um, I'm here to, to brief you, uh, as I've done in, in years past, on our mosquito control program uh, for 2019. Um, I guess it's just you know, so I can scroll down maybe. There we go. Very good. Um, so we, we do have a contract in place. We've awarded to, uh, this is a new contractor for us, but uh, the, the local pilot is one we've used in the past, uh, Matt Crabb. So Helicopter Applicators is the, um, the prime contractor, um, but we do, like I said, have experience utilizing this, using the site. Um, it is the largest capacity contract we've ever had. Um, we expanded it um, after last year to add um, both the granular, granular larva side, um, which is a bacteria based as well at the BTI, as well as the liquid larva side. So the granular has a little bit of residual. So if it goes on there and it sits and then it gets washed into some of these areas, it can still uh, combat uh, the mosquito larvae, whereas the liquid larva side is pretty targeted on larvae in that water. Yes, sir. Find BTI for everyone. Um, so the, I, I'm too, I'm too out of it from the, uh, I'll have to defer to Tim on the name again, but it's I can a, speak to it. It's a Latin, um, bacteria. It's Bacillus thuringiensis is really ansis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been years since I've been out in the field doing that, but so yes, short for that Latin name, but it, but it is a bacteria that attacks the gut of mosquito larvae. Mm -hmm. So it attacks their gut. They can't eat and therefore can't <laughs> grow into a pupa and then into the uh, adult mosquito. So that and it, it targets, it's really good at targeting mosquitoes in, in their larval form. Um, so with um, the capacity we have, we can do uh, basically, a, we kind of group them in 250 acres because Craney Island is so large, we try to target larger treatment areas. So five 250 acre applications of granular larvicide, um, six uh, 250 acre applications of liquid, and then we also have uh, adulticide, which this is the nailid um, adulticide, and this we treat 3,300 acres. So not only um, Craney Island, the Army Corps property, but we also treat uh, the Navy's field depot as well and, as well, and, and over the landfill. So we're getting a large expanse when we do a treatment with our adulticide, and we, have, we can do up to four applications. Uh, Um, I was kind of skipping up there, but that top title is uh, Habitat Reduction Plans. So one of the things we like to do also is what's called Habitat Reduction or Source Reduction, where you can work and removing vegetation and, and ditches and help the water drain, uh, eliminating areas or reducing areas where mosquitoes can, can thrive uh, as larvae. Um, so one of those, uh, as you may be aware, it, we have a problem with Phragmites in the region. It's an invasive reed that can grow uh, really tall, 15 to 20 feet tall, and, and grow, and it can shoot out roots across roads and, and kind of expand very quickly. So we work to treat those areas because when you have Phragmites growing in, in areas, it keeps it wet. It doesn't allow the sun to penetrate and, and dry areas out, um, so it can harbor more mosquitoes. So we do have um, a separate contract that'll be awarded later in the year. When you treat, uh, the best time of year to treat Phragmites is in the fall, in like September, October, and that knocks it down for several years in that area that you treat it. Um, so this will be a single 500 acre treatment, uh, approximately 20% of the site. We've been doing it many years now, so we can kind of, we can maintain it that way. Um, 
And then additionally, just in the operations of Craney Island, um, burial of, of eggs and mosquito larvae works, and, and when we're actively using a cell, placing in dredge material, it pretty much eliminates that cell from being uh, mosquito habitat. Um, it also helps with burying mosquito uh, phragmites when we're placing um, dredge material in. The past couple years, we've had one cell active and two drying out, which is also what you need to kind of consolidate and gain capacity for dredge material in the future. But we're doing some spillway replacements. Um, so we've had to do more treatments in the past few years um, to because of that drying out, you're having rainwater, you're having cracking uh, in the cells as they as they dry out. But uh, uh, talk, kind of follow up with what Richard was talking about with the deepening. Um, as Cranny Island gets used, the demand's going to increase quite a bit over the next few years for the deepening project and the volumes that we'll have to to uh, manage at Cranny Island. So, most likely two, if not all three, cells will be used in a given year, um, and I anticipate due to that a whole lot less habitat available for mosquitoes to, to grow. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll bring let's see down. if I can, is there a way to kind of scroll it in the middle? Thank you. So this next slide is a, is a table of our total treatments and the plans going forward. Um, I can report that we've, we've done it, we have uh, done an application of the granular larvicide, uh, the BTI, that was on 14 June, uh, covering 250 acres uh, with that. And that was targeting mosquito larvae that was found while monitoring the site. So we have staff at, at the Army Corps that are dedicated to going out to Craney Island to not only monitor mosquito larvae, but also for birds nesting in the area, water quality, and other things. But we are basically in coordination integrated with city staff, and Tim will, can speak more to this, where our staff's meeting with Tim, going around the site, locating habitat, locating mosquito larvae, and that way we can have effective treatments. Um, we also had a, um, an adulticide. It, it went on Saturday, we actually had scheduled it for Wednesday initially, and as you recall last week, every evening it would this area would blow up with some storm activity, mm -hmm. um, which prevented us from being able to treat on Wednesday and Thursday, and, and then Friday, even we just called it off immediately because of some of the storms that were projected. So it ended up being uh, Saturday evening, but the good news is is the, the mosquitoes that were active flying around, um, that they did, uh, was effective on, on killing those mosquitoes. Um, so now we're back to sort of a, a baseline on, on monitoring and, and habitat reduction, and then we'll do targeted uh, larvicides and aldicides moving forward. Uh, but this, this table kind of says the same thing what I mentioned on, on how much we have under the contract um, and also uh, brings in that Phragmites herbicide contract at the bottom. So that com concludes my briefing this evening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take. Questions? Paul. <clears throat> um, what are the effects on the elements that you're using to human beings? How long have people you been using it, and what's the harm to people? And are you using the same things across the complete spect spectrum of the city, or different here than there? So um, it is the same. Um, type uh, bacteria, same type uh, treatments that are done across the city as well as other localities. If anything, we're doing a little less. We have to, we had to go through a, um, a NEPA process, uh, environmental assessment, to assess, to basically say this is what we want to do and do an assessment and send that out to all the federal agencies, state regulatory agencies, as well as public input. And that was, um, I think, in 2003. I actually did that work. Um, and so we've been using the same treatment plan and same chemicals and same treatments since 2003 um, on the same areas. Uh, I, I'd say with, uh, and all of them are, have labels, EPA approved labels on how to use them, um, and that is put in our specifications for the contractor. Um, the biggest thing really is that we put out, when we put out a public notice that we're going to treat is for beekeepers saying, hey, if, if you have bees in the area, you should cover them during this time because the, the treatments can affect bees as, you know, as well as other insects. But in regards to human health, it's, it's very safe. And so and it's the same thing that, that the city's using as well as other localities. Are there any carcinogenic elements involved? 
Uh, so I'm, I don't believe so. I'd have to. I, that's one thing. It's kind of outside of my. I, I just know the. Uh, um, we can provide the environmental assessment that was was done. You know that and provide all the labels and 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 all that. But um, it is it is uh, the same thing that is utilized when the trucks go by and and the, and the neighborhoods and things. So. Uh, Tim can speak. There's Thibram too, I think, is the other one. Yeah, Nailid is used on the Army Corps property. It is. Could you stand up? Can you get ready for your presentation? Uh, the product used for adult deciding, so the adult mosquitoes, is different from what the city uses out of the truck. Um, both are EPA regulated. They all have labels, and they've gone through rigorous testing to get approved from the EPA. Uh, to my knowledge, neither what they use nor what we use has ever shown to have any consequences to anything other than mosquitoes, flies, and bees. That's why we have such a push for beekeepers to be notified. Mm -hmm. um, Nail it in particular has been used for I think over 50 years uh, and it's constantly being looked at for various effects other than what it's being used for and they haven't found anything. Very good. Cosmogenic uh, materials. As far as I'm aware of, no. <clears throat> I, I'd have to look back at the MSDS, but I'm pretty sure that's a, that's that would be a big issue for us using it if it, if it has been found for that. And MSDS is the material safety data sheets that go along with that EPA label. Bill, how many uh, treatment flights are uh, scheduled for the summer? So, for adult aside, we can do up to four. So we've done one. Um, typically, we get a grace period in the summer where things dry out, and we don't really need to target. Um, and so we do. We often do more larva siding, uh, usually four, four or five in a season, and and uh, several adult aside. But um, usually they're later in the year, like August, September. So the flights aren't uh, pre-scheduled. They are no, on a, as need basis. Yes, absolutely. It's really based on the monitoring, um, so both larval monitoring as well as the city's traps, the test data, the trap data that shows how many mosquitoes are being caught in a, in a given night. Who, who pulls the uh, the trigger on the on the need for aerial flight? Uh, the city or? Uh, I'd say it's a coordinated effort based on what they're seeing on the ground. It's sort of a recommendation from the technical team on the ground and based on the numbers that are being caught. And, and observed, um, but ultimately the recommendation comes from the technical team to our contracting officer representative, and then he will provide a recommendation to me, and I can, I'll say yes or no. But typically the COR is is going to move out because time of time is of the essence. A mosquito can go from an egg hatch out and be an adult within a week, so um, it's very fast. Um, so. By the time you see in larvae, if you can't treat within a few days, you're going to miss that window to it to get that bloom, and, and then you would need to go after the adults. And then once when they hatch out, the adults, the the female mosquitoes are look seeking a blood meal within 24 or 48 hours to then lay new eggs and start the cycle again. And so we try to stay ahead of that cycle Easy. is the goal because once you get ahead of, ahead of, then you get multiple generations kind of asynchronous versus a kind of a synchronous cycle. Are there any uh, Air Force uh, C-130 flights scheduled for this? There's nothing scheduled that I know of, and Tim may know more than I do, but he typically we have one. Um, usually they say, yes, we can come, and it's like an August time frame, and, but it's at the mercy of if there's another, if there's a national emergency. Sometimes we've, we've had it scheduled, and they've been pulled down to Texas to say for Hurricane Harvey, where they, it's a sort of a national need. But uh, usually in August, and is there a date, Tim? He, uh, he has yeah, it in I'll, his I'll presentation. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah he's, he's going to talk about the city's efforts. Okay. I just have one question. Yes, ma'am. I guess we never really thought about, you know, the, the community gardening and the things that people are doing to grow their own crops. I mean, does this stay airborne, the larva sides and the adult sides, or do they land on ground? I mean, have there been any correlation to any fruits or vegetables being affected by the chemical? No, and, and that's part of the reason um, we have to, we have dates scheduled and they get moved because if it's, if, the, if there's bad weather, if it's too windy, you have to have pretty good conditions to be able to fly and, and also the safety of the, the pilot. 
Um, but they've done a lot of tests to be able to do the spray and, and have the size of the, the particles that are coming down to effectively treat an area and not have drift onto other properties because it's not a benefit to what we're trying to treat and you know and you're losing out so um, no there's a lot of work done on the particle size the droplet size to be able to get it and and then the test done you, you can kind of put it out there and put paper and kind of see your goal is to have a certain number of droplets or particles per square inch or square per meter um, but yeah the goal is not to have that drift so if there's certain weather or windy conditions we pull it off and that's what happens sometimes in previous years mm -hmm. where you're trying to get out there you know you need to treat them the weather won't allow you and then it just the mosquitoes are you know saved by that <laughs> by the weather okay. other questions Thank you, sir. Thanks. All right, Mr. Du Bois will come forward and talk about the city's mosquito control efforts. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. I'm here to talk to you tonight about the city's program for mosquito control. Once it starts. <laughs> All right, so in 2019, we reintroduced public outreach and education. Uh, Mosquito Control has put on free workshops at local parks. Um, just this month earlier, we were at Paradise Creek. We've also assisted in training in the Hampton Roads area, revitalized our website, um, and with the website, we actually reintroduced um, the Buzz, which is a monthly newsletter uh, for citizens to read about what we do, who we are, uh, and what they can expect from us. Um, we've also reached out to the health department to increase uh, efforts to outreach programs um, that we, have, we may not have thought about. Um, we also recently just did an interview on PCTV or public, uh, Portsmouth's public channel. Um, as far as surveillance is concerned, surveillance is an important aspect of any pest control program. We set traps weekly throughout the city. Uh, the picture on the top is the trap itself. Uh, that in coordination with citizen calls will kind of guide our team to an area that is experiencing mosquito uh, population levels that are above the threshold and give them the best resources available to control the mosquitoes before they hatch off to adults. Um, interdepartmental communication is key and with that we've reached out and tried to open communication lines with codes and compliance, um, stormwater and other departments within the city. Um, this picture in the lower right hand corner is a dipper that is full of mosquito larvae so that goes to show you how small they are out there. Um, our crews go out routinely during the day in an area. They check for these larvae right here, um, and when they are found, we do application treatments with products similar to what the Army Corps of Engineers uses on the island. Um, outside of the city departments, we have uh, good communication with other governmental agencies such as the Army Corps of Engineers, um, the Navy Fuel Depot, um, and the shipyard, and with that, we assist them with any type of uh, advice or control measures that they um, that they are making sure that the, the mosquitoes on their properties are being taken care of as well. When necessary, we have four trucks outfitted with sprayers. Um, the city is divided into nine separate areas. On a worst case scenario, we can hit all nine uh, sections of the city within approximately three days. Um, weather permitting, uh, the Army Corps also stated that it's the same thing with the planes, uh, wind, rain, temperatures being either too hot or too cold um, reduce the chance of us being able to go out at night and control mosquito levels. Every truck is outfitted with a GPS unit and that tells the driver where to go, where not to go, um, and actually tracks the information that's uh, required from us um, through federal and state regulations. We've also really increased our, um, our tracking capabilities and are working with local beekeepers. In the last couple of years, hobby beekeeping has been um, booming in the whole entire Hampton Roads area, not just Portsmouth. Um, so we've seen an increase in those beekeepers and just trying to communicate with them, letting 
them know that we need to know where their hive is in order for us not to spray their hive and have um, adverse effects. Aerial spraying, um, as far as contracting operations over Craney Island, the Army Corps engineer uh, have went over the details for you there. Um, and then the Air Force unit based out of Youngstown, Ohio is scheduled again to appear this year. Um, typically we have two spray dates a year. Um, again, that's it's, it's a based on availability of the pilot, the program itself, if they're not pulled from to another place due to a hurricane or another natural disaster or even another um, army base overseas. Um, and the tentative dates are usually the end of July and the end of August based off a historical uh, reference of when the mosquitoes are, are starting to bloom up. And with that, that is all I have unless there's any other questions. Questions, Bill? Uh, the fog from the trucks, uh, I get asked that a lot. Uh, how long does that stay effective, say, after they go down the street? So the, uh, the truck spraying operations, the products that we use, it's up in the air, and as soon as it hits the ground or vegetation, it's gone. So if it doesn't hit the mosquito when it's up in the air, when the truck goes by, that's, that's what you got. Okay, cool. so, so it's an immediate mm -hmm. thing. Yep. There is no residual based on, on vegetation or on the ground afterwards. And that goes to your question earlier about the uh, increase of gardens and, gardens and stuff like that. As soon as it's on the ground, it's done. Okay. You just kind of make contact with the mosquito yeah. at yes, sir. that point in order Absolutely. to be fatal to the mosquito. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, we will, yes, we will have Chief uh, Green to come forward with the public safety yeah. update. Good evening, Mayor Rowe, Vice Mayor Lucas Burke, members of City Council, Dr. Patton. Thank you for allowing me to update you on our initiative that was first presented to you on April 9th. The first slide shows our wounded victims by firearms starting from January 1st, 2019 through June 21st of 2019 compared to same time frame in 2018. As you can see, we had 11 less victims of firearms compared to 2018, but unfortunately we have increased in those individuals that have succumbed to their injuries from firearms, seven in 2018 at that time frame to 14 in 2019. This is a more of a detailed incident. I will break down for you for the incidents that have occurred up until June 21st. When we look at the homicide, 15 currently in the city compared to eight of last year. The reason we have such a high clearance rate, 11 out of the 15 with a 73% clearance rate is because an overwhelming majority of the offenders are known offenders. Six out of the 15 victims were domestic related for 40% of the homicides. Eight out of the 15 creating 53% of our homicides were due to arguments from alcohol, drugs, or money owed. To this date, we only know of one individual that did not know their offender before the homicide, and that was in a 900 block of Portsmouth Boulevard where the individual was going to the convenience store. A suspect attempted to rob him. He tried to fight off the suspect. He was shot and unfortunately succumbed to his injuries. Of the four homicides that we do not have clear today, we have strong suspects in all four homicides working closely with the Commonwealth attorney to have warrants secured in the near future. Wanted to point out with the aggravated assaults, we are now even and out as of June 21st with the aggravated assaults. As of yesterday, we have a 1% decrease and we hope to continue to decrease. Want to make a note with the aggravated assaults as well when we look into the details of that. Only three are individuals that did not know their offenders before they were assaulted. First one happened on February 14th with an adult female that was in the parking lot and she was leaving her car when a group of juveniles were running by shooting and she had gotten hit in her leg by a stray bullet. 
Then the second one happened on April 16th, a commercial robbery, where the security guard tried to fight off the armed subject. He was shot, and we made an arrest in that incident. The last one happened on June 5th, 200 block of Dale Drive, where a 12-year-old boy was playing in the area when a known gang member was shooting at a car filled with females who had an altercation with a female he knew earlier. One of the stray bullets grazed the 12-year-old boy. He was seen by medics on scene and treated and released. The reason I have... Chief, hold on. Yes. Could you... Tell me what an aggravated assault is. Sure. So an aggravated assault is uh, any individual that gets a cut, stab wound, any permanent injury, shot, broken bones, something significant. So it's not just, it's not just like a, a slap or a punch and nothing happened but a bruise, but it has to be something that requires stitches mm -hmm. and leaves some, a permanent injury. That's an aggravated assault. The reason we have this slide up to look at the incidents, when I presented to you on April 9th, we were focused in the three areas in the circles, 212, 111, and the 112 zone. To date, we're still seeing an increase in the 111 and the 112 zones down here. 212 zone, we have a 67% decrease because of our efforts. The reason I have the arrest stats up there is even though we've made a significant amount of arrests in those three areas to include at least 18 firearms recovered, the reason we're still seeing an increase in those two areas is because we developed that we have two different gangs operating in those areas. We have a set of gangs in the Dale Holmes area. Mm -hmm. These individuals do not live in that area. Mm -hmm. They are not residents, but they are being allowed to conduct their criminal activity in that area. Do they live in Portsmouth, do you know? Most of them do, yes. Okay. Southside Gardens area over here in the 111 area is a so totally different set of gang members that are having organized dice games, mm -hmm. which are resulting in robberies and aggravated assault, and we know that they're also stealing motor vehicles and larceny from motor vehicles to further enhance their criminal activity. So what we have done in response to that, we knew at the end of May with the Memorial Day incident that happened in Chesapeake, where 10 individuals were shot and one were killed, that they alerted us that it was members of the gang in Dale Holmes. They are also known to, to possibly be related to the MacArthur Mall shooting in Norfolk. So we created a gang intelligence unit to closely work with our street crimes unit to identify the organization, the offenders, to place charges on them, to remove them for the community for two important reasons. First, so they don't commit any more harm to our residents. And second, for their own protection, because we know that the rival gangs from the other jurisdictions are coming into Portsmouth. So again, what we're doing, that's what we're doing. We're seeing um, large <laughs> dividends in that. Uh, more notably, Saturday, just this past Saturday, the 22nd, our unit was looking on social media, saw individuals, a young group of teenagers in a new Jeep riding around Portsmouth waving guns. They were videotaping this. Our officers went into the Portsmouth area where they observed them on a video, spotted the vehicle, five of those individuals were in the vehicle. We caught three of those individuals, recovered a firearm, all three of those are in jail, and those individuals are tied to the Southside gang. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to mention, when we arrested the one adult for the Dale Holmes shooting, he was in a car with three other individuals. Those were also arrested, and three guns were recovered from that vehicle. So we're gonna continue with those enforcements and also work with the community and have a walk on Thursday in Dale Homes because we know the residents in those areas are very grateful and appreciative for the officers to be there. They have told us that, they have told the property managers that, as well as Southside Gardens. But we're still not getting them to call us when they see these individuals that don't live in the area and should not be there. So we need to connect that with them to educate them. Yes. What's the goal of a, of a walk? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I hear what you're saying about the gangs come from the outside mm -hmm. in, and, and certainly the walk uh, probably gives the residents uh, uh, a good feeling yes, sir. Uh, of safety, but that's temporary. Mm -hmm. 
So what, uh, the, what's the ultimate goal? Yes, sir. The ultimate goal is to try to gain their trust, that they see the police officers not just when a crime occurs and we come out there to be reactive, but that we're out there talking to them, engaging with them, asking them about their quality of life that they have, if they have issues with trash, lighting, anything that we can do. We go out there with other city officials so that they can provide them with resources as well. But we want to break down that barrier that the only time they see us is during enforcement action. Because again, like I said, we're not gaining their trust for them to call us when they see those individuals out there. So we want them to be comfortable with us to know that if they call us, we will come and solve their problems. So that's why we do the walks to have that one-to-one -one communication. A absolutely, in a non-law enforcement capacity. So they see us outside of something bad happening. Very good. Paul. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have satellite offices there? We do not have satellite offices due to we don't have a manpower to staff a satellite office. Well, is most of the crime being committed in those areas? Yes, sir. I have a response. If we had a satellite office, the issue that you have with that is you have to have it staffed all the time to have an individual in the office. The crimes are going to happen on the outside, and if we don't have an individual in the office, we give the false impression that someone is there, and if someone needs help, they go to the office and nobody is there because they're outside of the office engaging with the community and trying to arrest the offenders and prevent criminal activity. So we would have to have, it's a great idea, but I would have to have the staff and numbers that I can staff someone in that office all the time. Okay, Lisa. Now, we did, and Paul, I just had a response to your question because as a liaison to the Portion Each Redevelopment year. Housing Authority, mm -hmm. I spoke with Mr. Ed Bland and Elisa Winston, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that, that what was brought up to the table of having the satellite offices back at the Dale home. And of course, Lincoln Park is going down, but they're going to be bringing up a new development out there. Uh, but that's one of the things that they wanted to try to work with a with partner us. to bring mm -hmm. um, right. that satellite office back to um, the Portion Redevelopment Housing um, Authority of uh, sites. Um, so, but this is an element that we have to have. This is something we can just look around and mm -hmm. push aside and mm -hmm. accept this. If that's where the crime is, that's where we got to put the officers. There's been some conversations, so hopefully we can get. Let's, um, Shannon's, Shannon's has to floor, then Bill, and then Nate. Okay, a couple, couple questions, Chief. Sure. Um, First of all, I know when you came before us before, there was a initiative that was going to be put in place with the state police. Yes. And so I'm trying to, can you help me understand why that hasn't happened yet? Absolutely. It's there, the third point, which is we're finalizing with the state police. We met in early June. And part of the requirement for the Virginia State Police to go into any jurisdiction is they have to meet with the Commonwealth Attorney first to get their roles, the expectations of what they're allowed and not allowed to do in a jurisdiction. We just set that date for July 16th at 10 a.m. in Richmond, so we will go to Richmond with our Commonwealth Attorney, and hopefully shortly after that date we'll get a firm start date from Virginia State Police. Okay, and, and the second part to that question, the Sheriff's Department has has initiated a sheriff's anti-violence effort. Are you aware of that effort? Yes, I am. Are, are you all collaborating with the sheriff's department? I was uh, not asked to, to collaborate. Together? I know that our, our officers have been out there and seen them riding in the area, but I was not asked formally or informally for any collaboration. But 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 here's my point. I, whether you're asked or not, do you all have a relationship where you talk to each other, where you could inquire, hey, what are you guys doing, and how can we, and how can we help that effort to make our community safe? I, I get the asking thing, right. but 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 you can't always wait to ask somebody. You got to be proactive in reaching out because we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about safety. Mm -hmm. It's summertime in the communities. We have more children out and about in the communities. So I think we need to look, need a little bit more proactive. Activity. Yes. And, and we, we've talked already okay. about the violent crime, which is why he's actually involved with us with the Virginia State Police. So we have talked. Yes. Very good. Okay, well, the order is Bill, then Nate, and then Dr. Pat, and then 
at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Good, good Mayor. Cool. Well, my, well, may not. No. Bill. <laughs> Nate. Uh, my, my point is we, we can't not afford to have additional security. Uh, whether we can, uh, maybe it's a grant or something that we could apply for, but uh, I think it's a deployment issue. Uh, uh, we, we, we need to have the security where, where the crimes uh, are occurring. And we can't afford to have another child hit by a, a, a ricochet exactly. or a, a, a missed uh, shot. That's exactly so right. So we, we, I know we can't answer that tonight, but I, I think uh, from my perspective, I see a consensus that that's needed. Uh, Nate. The, uh, <clears throat> some of these are reoccurring, you know, excess of 20 years ago, we were dealing with the same issues. Yes, sir. And, you know, with the PRHA properties, and that's something I think the communication needs to be there. Years ago, we had a lot of officers, we were listed as agents of the PRHA property, which being an agent, then you can enforce the trespassing issues. Yes. And the way we did back then, we had trespassing warning forms, and we kept a file with dispatch. So if we caught somebody out there that did not live there, the first time we'd issue them that one warning form, they'd get a copy, a copy would stay on file. The next time that they were physically caught out there with no need to be there, the officer could charge them with trespassing and haul them away without having another agent there. So I think that possibly something if they're not already doing it. We, we are we, still you know, doing that, do sir. So yes, sir. Good, because yes, that that's was... That's a great tool for us. And, and, that's, yes, and that's the issue is, just like I've said before, a lot of these neighborhoods, it's not the majority of people that live there. Absolutely. It's the ones coming from outside. And years ago, we dealt with the same problems. The majority of people we arrested were even coming from Suffolk and farther to do their business. And after we started the initiative, and back then it was Ida Barber was the hot spot, mm -hmm. and it, it was dramatic to change. You actually had people and people that lived there that would come outside and sit on their porches because prior to our enforcement, they were trapped in their house because they were scared to come outside. So, I mean, that's if y'all are doing that with state police coming, I mean, it just comes down to enforcement. If that's where the hot spots are, we yes, just need sir. to get out there and do what needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sir. Yeah, yes, Mayor, as um, uh, the Chief has said and uh, answered, uh, Mr. Glover, um, in conversation with the Commonwealth Attorney, the original date was June 22nd. It was the state police who could not get all of their officers that they wanted to be involved in the Richmond meeting on that date. And so she waited for them to set the date, which is the 16th. But um, as um, it is made clear in our discussion, she is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of as the Commonwealth Attorney and that no entity, the state police or anyone can come in to assist with uh, um, um, uh, safety reinforcement un uh, until she approves it and she feels that she's right on target and what she needs will happen at that 16 meeting and they are going to Richmond for that meeting. The second thing quickly I'd like to call to attention, which I called to our liaison's attention, is that it was through the police in a meeting last week that they called to my attention that in Swanson Homes, dealing with trash and things, that in October of 2018, PRHA discontinued the city's trash pickup and they relegated that to the cost. So they called to our attention that trash is everywhere. The, the um, uh, containers are there, but then as um, it was indicated, how would you feel, your citizen, someone takes your trash container and now you have to walk out your door to get your trash out in a parking lot. So um, we have reached out to Mr. Bland to set up a meeting. Mrs. August would just said that she's reached out, she had got the response. And then the chief and I met with Mr. Bland in regard to him wanting to look to see how he could return to the, an apartment, well, he said an apartment where a satellite office could be set up. Mm -hmm. And he's still con continuing to cover the part-time, I guess in the night, where people are on the property, as Mr. Um, Clark said, and if you're not supposed to be there, then you get a citation and eventually you get put in jail. And we do have a office in Swanson Homes, but again, it is not manned 24 hours due to manpower issues. Yes, sir. Well, Elizabeth had had a chance to speak, so let's. Yes, sir. Give you okay. I just want to be clear on overtime initiatives at the yes. top. We're all talking about need for more enforcement. Is that what overtime initiatives is? You have yes. 
Is our that, first is that we're gonna or we already have we, we already have so in April we were not using any overtime it was just our street crimes officers which were six officers when we started noticing an increase in gangs we supplemented that with a gang Intel unit which is three more officers and a supervisor but outside of them working we wanted to staff it like we said or at every day during the night when the incidents were happening, the only way we could do that was to do overtime. So we're paying officers at nighttime when street crimes and the gang unit are off to be in those areas during the nighttime. So we have pretty much 24 hour coverage in the area. Mm -hmm. Paul. When I ask you these questions, yes, sir. it's not saying that you or the police department are not doing your job or are shortcoming because these problems exist outside of what y'all do. You just have to carry the weight of it. Mm -hmm. yes. Problems true. really uh, um, need to be addressed uh, in the things that go on in the city. And um, I'm really, <laughs> destroyed that for so many years that this condition persists as if we don't know how to alleviate and put things in place that can make the city much better. We do know and and we're going to get to that shortly. We're moving. This is no kick on you or the police department. As I say, this is just something that's dumped in your lap from shortcomings on our other areas of the city. But we're gonna we're gonna get to that. We're, we're gonna work. And, and I think together. yes, sir. And I think that ties into the next one with the chat chew and you engaging our community. This was more of a holistic vision where Dr. Patton brought this to fruition along with Deputy City Manager Mr. Pace, where on July 20th. We're going to have a candid and open discussion to the public, every area of the city of Portsmouth, to come and talk with us. We're going to explain to them what is going on, how they can help us prevent future incidents to improve their quality of life and help us put away those individuals we know that are in a community doing harm. And again, when we talk about the holistic approach, we don't just want to talk to the individuals, we want to provide them with resources that can help them heal themselves and family members. We're going to have mental health, behavioral health out there to talk about trauma-informed resources for adults and children. We're also going to have social services out there to talk about the importance of school attendance and how it can negatively affect the household if their children do not attend school. We're also going to have the Attorney General bring down some information for the GRIP program, Gang Reduction Intervention Program, for those young adults or juveniles that are thinking about getting in a gang or in a gang, resources on how to get out of a gang. Also, we want to make sure that individuals don't come to the program because maybe they have young kids. So we're going to have children activities there through parks and recs, face painting, gamer bus, the star Base victory program to introduce Introduce them to STEM, as well as the Elizabeth Project River Wildlife Exhibit. And then in the overall scheme of things, we want to make sure that the individuals have transportation. So Mr. Pace is going to have parks and recs. Go to those individual communities, Swanson Homes, Dale Homes, Lincoln Park, Southside Gardens, to pick up those individuals and drop them off. But more importantly, pick them up at the hurricane evacuation routes. That's <laughs> pre-planning and preparing the hurricane. before hurricane season comes so they're familiar with evacuation routes before emergencies happen. So again, this is a holistic approach that we are trying to do to educate and prevent from future incidents from occurring. Very good. Yes, sir. I, I would recommend, I, I like the approach to that. I think it's a, it's a good concept. But I would recommend instead of doing that, if we could do something, if it's a big event, it sounds like this will be a big event. Mm -hmm. but, but after this big event happens, I would recommend that we look at this maybe on a quarterly or biannual basis. Because, because just doing it one time, 
it, it, it just loses its, its, its flair. And, and, and if we could do something on a consistent basis and have an expectation, I think that creates trust. Yes. It creates all those things that you just indicated were important to to, to minimizing these incidents. Yes, sir. This is just the initial one. Like any pro program that sure. we do, we do it and then we analyze it. How can we do it better? Absolutely. And we bring more resources and bring it back, like you said, quarterly, biannually, whatever best fits because we work with other city agencies. But I totally agree with you. It needs to be on a regular routine basis. Phil. If, uh, if a citizen sees uh, a crime or a gang member doing something or somebody uh, doing something illegal. What's what's the vehicles? How how do they report that now? Well, we ask the citizens to call 911 because if they see individuals out there at the moment, we need to go out there while the incidents are occurring to try to catch them in the act or prevent something from occurring. But let's say it's not an immediate thing, but they've noticed an activity that they want to uh, <coughs> to report. They can contact us through their district lieutenants or just call the non-emergency number and they can get our information. But the district lieutenants that are in those areas take all of those concerns and they push it out to the uniform patrol or narcotics or wherever else and they'll stay in constant contact with the citizen to let them know and follow up what they're doing with that problem. Knowing that uh, the Millennials and, and even most of us uh, usually have a phone, and, and they're used to having an app. Used yes. used to uh, texting. Do we have anything where uh, a young person seeing something going on can? Text? I believe three one one. We're going to get an app and ability to tonight. text as well. Yes. Okay. What, what's the status? Of, of that? uh, that's being um, announced tonight. The start, and if okay. Ms. Simmons doesn't have it already to announce, Mr. Pace, where is Mr. Oh, you looking at me? I like what you have. <laughs> <laughs> you give it to us. <laughs> All right, he has it. So yeah, it's already done. Present. So yeah. that's that's being announced tonight. The start. So that will and the how to do it. That will uh, be an app associated with that. That. I'm not certain, Mr. Jones. Is an has an app been created for the three one one, or can one be created? Can you create one? I mean, we can work on creating an app for uh, non-emergency. He can do that. Reporting. Yeah, it might not be a bad uh, 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 idea. I think you might get more input from young people out on the street. Right. Then calling instead of calling. Call. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Great right. right. idea. Yeah, just, just one other question um, from the slide on page four where, with the incidents and the contraband that was recovered. Yes, um, ma'am. Are they as a result of an incident? So, so you arrest somebody and then you find cocaine or uh, somebody there's been a shooting and then you find counterfeit money or, I mean, how do you get, right. how do you? Well, mo I do not know the intricate details of each arrest, okay. but most of the arrests are because of an incident has occurred or they've been alerted in the area. A of course, in a lot of arrests, like say we do a trespass and arrest, mm -hmm. the search incident to arrest, we may recover cocaine or dr other drugs on the persons. One of the, like the firearms, the Jeep that they were in were a stolen vehicle. Right. So once that vehicle was stopped, then we recovered the firearm. The other vehicle with the wanted subject in it from the shooting incident in Dale Drive, three of those firearms were inside the vehicle as well. So a lot of those incidents, we do recover firearms firearms and drugs because they're connected to another arrest. Any other comments? All right, I, I have two. Yes, One. sir. This was such an important report and we have a different audience during our regular session. We'll put this on the agenda under special presentations for you to give the same report tonight. Yes, sir. The second comment, I got a call from a citizen. If I'll take this opportunity that lives in the 800 block of Duke Drive. Mm -hmm. and there's gang activity across the street from in that block, if you would. Uh, yes, sir. Make we will take care of that. Care of that. We will. Give the 800 block of Duke Drive. Right. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Thank you. Sir. I appreciate it. <laughs> Mayor, I just one additional when um, the chief said we're continuing. Um, August, we just this week started and working on it with the schools. Um, August the 24th, which is a Saturday, 
uh, through uh, the 31st of August will be um, back to school week. And on the 24th, we're planning a back to school parade. We have uh, Dr. Reese and I met for three hours and just talking about covering different things. And then I said to him, you know, school opens every year and the kids just, all you hear is buy some shoes or whatever. I said, we want a campaign where the businesses, we have signs in their windows, um, good luck back to school. Something to say that education is important and that uh, the whole community is back uh, behind. And I shared that the only city in the country, and it's the, their 89th year, that has a whole week of back to school is the city of Chicago. It's the Bud Billiken Parade, and that is Education <coughs> Week, the second second Saturday in um, August every year, and it's the 89th year. And with that said, the Sunday after the parade is Education Sunday, and so the churches in the city have something that celebrates education, and that's what we're working toward for this August, the last week in August. We'll be giving you more information on it. Uh, let's go to your report backs, any report backs that you've got. All right, um, I, um, I have, um, I received an email in regard to uh, one of the, um, it, it, as it pertains to, okay, it pertains to one of the, um, the, the amendment, not the amendment, the um, resolution for the Virginia Retirement System Multiplier for Public Safety. All of the other eight um, city managers reports are grants, which are money amounts, which, but I want to report that the question was asked um, just how um, is this particular resolution and what is in place is funded. And the um, re response is for the city to provide the enhanced hazardous duty benefit, it will cost um, the city 80000 uh, $14, and to increase the multiplier by 1.85 uh, for public safety employees, the cost is $673,447. Uh, with such measures, the city is now um, um, in line with other Hampton Roads cities as it pertains to the multiplier. The question was, well, how did the city find the new money? And there is no new source of revenue. This funding is through the increased uh, amounts in the city ongoing revenue such as property taxes. Okay. Let's go to uh, council. Can I just make one statement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think the public needs to know since that question was asked, if they're not aware of it, everybody that's here that works under VRS, they pay 5% of their salary into their own retirement. So it's not all being paid for by us. Right. Good point. Good point. Very Let's good. go to city council liaison reports and I'll start, I'll start with Shannon. I don't have it at this time. Here. Hey. Yes. Um, we had the regional jail board, Hampton Roads Regional Jail Board meeting this past week. Uh, update we had on transportations between our last meetings, there was 2,246 transports. 535 of those were medically related. They had an excess of 5,000 individuals uh, seen for sick call. Uh, this is the third year we have the uh, mental health grant. They had 144 people screened under that grant, 83 were approved. They have spent approximately $110,000 in reference to housing and medical, and this follows some of these individuals once they are released from the facility. Current staffing, uh, the total number that they, staffing would be 237. We're currently at 216, which is only 21 vacancies, and they're continuing to go out and recruit at numerous job fairs. Um, they're also offering incentive to current employees that if they help somebody come in, if they're hired and they're there for six months, they get $250. Once the individual completes their academy training and one year of service, that individual will get an additional $250. Uh, medical report from WellPath is to contract the medical. We had uh, three individuals that received dialysis. We have 45 patients with HIV medication for the cost of May. For that was $101,409. We, we had uh, temporary, in reference to temporary detention orders, we had nine pos, pos, petitions for the TDOs in the month of May. Uh, seven of those nine were committed to a mental health institution, and that goes to they're having these screenings because some people should not be in that facility. So once they're screened in TDO, they send them out to a mental health facility. Uh, we have 18 pregnant women in the facility. Three of them are currently receiving opiate replacement maintenance. Uh, 
one of the individuals is giving her baby up for adoption once it's born. Another information that we did find out was going forward, pregnant females are going to be sent to Norfolk Centera because Maryview is closing their birthing center. There's 14 patients that have cancer. There's two currently receiving chemo. There's 15 men over the age of 65, one female over the age of 65. We have six that are paraplegics. We have one that recently received a liver transplant, one that's a hemophiliac, one patient needing a lung transplant, one patient needing a craniotomy, and one patient with celiac disease. And uh, one of the other important things to discuss at last meeting, we had been doing bi-monthly meetings. Starting next month, we will have monthly meetings because there's so much to discuss. We decided it was better to do it once a month. And that's the end of the report. Thank you. Yes, um, PRHA, a um, couple of updates. Um, uh, the PRHA general counsel um, attorney um, will meet with our city attorney um, to go over the cooperative agreement. That's that 1956 document um, that they want to discuss to make sure that the city and PRHA are compliant with what needs to be paid, payment in lieu of taxes, the pilot, um, all of those kinds of things. So they will discuss that and they want to have that done before our joint meeting in October. Um, did announce to you all that um, that Buddha Group was awarded the tax credits uh, to proceed with the building of the Holly Point um, workforce development that's going to be reduced from 59 units to 50 units, um, and that will be right at the corner of Effingham and County Street. Um, they're working on the timeline for when that's going to begin and when that will be uh, done, but they're pretty excited about that project. So um, other than that, in our October meeting, um, we're on board with everything. Thank you, Bill. I attended the Historic Preservation Commission meeting. They had two items on their consent agenda. One was new construction on Florida Avenue, I think 536 Florida. And also there was a, uh, a renovation item on Mount Vernon. Also attended a tour uh, over on the Burton Station of, of some uh, shipyard property that uh, on behalf of the PPIC I'm a liaison to that, and uh, that's uh, for uh, long-range uh, potential use of the city at some point in time. Mm -hmm. The Department of Social Services will be having their second tour drop on the 29th of this month. It will be from noon to 3. Uh, same setup, set up. Anybody want to come out and to assist, please do. Historical Society, they counsel their meeting this month. As you know, the Hampton Roads Transportation Planning Organization is the regional agency that's responsible for the uh, planning and authorization <coughs> of the projects that are undertaken by HR TAC. At its January 2019 meeting, I made the motion that we create a committee within that uh, group, the TPO, and it's primarily mayors, with the goal of, as I said, blowing up the contract between the state and ERC. Mm -hmm. We all declared that that contract is bad for the region mm -hmm. and bad for the Commonwealth. Uh, that committee meets tomorrow in this room. <coughs> uh, the Secretary of Transportation will be here along with the uh, Commissioner of the Virginia Department of Transportation and the Deputy Secretary of, of Transportation. Very good. Very good. So with that, uh, we have a need to go into closed session. Is there a motion to go into closed session? Mm -hmm. um, I move to go into closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A.1 for the purpose of discussion, consideration, and interviews of potential candidates for appointment to boards and commissions. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion that's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All right, we're ready for the question. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll call vote, please? Yes. Mr. Battle? Yes. Mr. Clark? Yes. Mr. Glover? Yes. Vice Mayor Lucas Byrne? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Ms. Simmons? Yes. Mayor Rowe? Yes, we're in closed session. If you're not a part of the session, please leave the room.